What's good, everybody? It's Big Game James, my guy, DDP of Dallas Prospect, you know, Big Game James channel. And we're talking basketball, football, NBA, NFL, Mavericks, Cowboys, Episode 7, Positively Relentless. And we're going to talk some Mavericks offseason, definitely NBA draft because DDP's got all the hot scoop on these players. And then we're going to slide right into the Dallas Cowboys offseason and some rumblies already going on. Dalton Schultz tied in, say he's going to sit out the rest of OTAs until he gets paid. Guess what, DDP? Never a dull day in Dallas, right? Especially with the Dallas Cowboys. But hey, let's jump right into this Mavericks talk. And if you want to talk about draft, let's open that up because I've been interested on, on some players because we've been seeing free agents, this and that. But I think we got to get some influx of some young players back in there. So talk to, let's, talk to me about this draft, DDP. Yeah, absolutely, man. So first of all, for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, any and Duca did a great breakdown on the Dallas prospect YouTube channel, uh, like 45 minute breakdown, like four tiers, like insanely well-researched, um, had names that I certainly knew nothing about. And, you know, any, any is way more the draft intensive guy than I am. Like the, the people that I'm aware of is names I had heard mention of and read a little bit about here and there, but he, he was like, no, 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 you really need to look at this guy. And I was like, okay, okay, I'll look. And then I looked and I was like, I agree. <laughs> so a lot, a lot of stuff like that, but um, yeah, there are three names in particular that stood out to me that I think are certainly obtainable. It depends. Like they're varying degrees, obviously he, he had a couple names um, that aren't on this list, but they, those guys are like, it would take a tremendous stroke of luck for them to fall to you at 26 where Dallas picks. So with that being the case, I, I wanted to stay more in the ballpark of what's more likely. And so three names that interested me, every one of these guys I'm looking at is a guard or a forward. Like I know we talk about needing a big, there are bigs on his list and that are of interest to me, but there wasn't really anyone good enough as a center likely to be there in that position that I was like, yeah, I, 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 I kind of have the same philosophy as if it's the NFL draft. I like to say like, let's look at it from best player available, not going from a preset list, you know, like get the talent there more than worrying about like, well, we are, we're a little thin here. So we'll take this guy. That's not as good, but he fills this need, get the best player you can. So mm -hmm. first guy I'm looking at here is uh, guard Dalen Terry. He's a six, seven guard out of Arizona. I like bigger guards for sure. He's got a six ten wingspan. I love that in the guard. Um, he's a three and D player, kind of like a Dorian Finney Smith, except he actually brings a little bit of, uh, playmaking ability as well. And that's something that Dodo kind of hinted at a little bit this year, but really has just never been a part of his game, obviously. So getting another guy that can make plays a little bit, put the ball on the deck and make stuff happen while defending and being a very respectable three and D guy. I like that. I like that. I don't think you can have too many of those guys. So that's, that's the first one. And I think he is very obtainable in that range. I, th I think there's a good chance. Now, I, I think any said in his video, there have been mock drafts showing him as high as 17, but more often than not, he's in that 24 to 28 range from what I was seeing. So I think he's going to have a good chance of being there. So that's one to consider. Okay. This guy, you might know about a little bit more just because of proximity. Uh, EJ Liddell, six, seven, forward out of Ohio state. Oh yeah. Yep. Uh, very, as any put it, Draymond-esque. He like says, it. yeah, he says he's kind of your prototypical small ball center, which again, if we're going to look at going a, a little bit unconventional here, hey, well, we do small ball about as well as anybody this side of Golden State. So mm -hmm. maybe there's some value there. Uh, he says he has great defensive versatility, which is why he can play um, your small ball center. He can switch anywhere from the two through five, basically. Uh, and he says he has a high basketball IQ. His shooting touch, though, is better than Draymond. Draymond used to be able to shoot a little bit, but he has not been able to really hit the broadside of a barn in like five, six years, it seems like. And so you don't have to worry about that. But what's what really stood out is he is nails from the corner three. And that is like the bread and butter of Dallas's offense, especially in that playoff run. So if you're able to add a guy like that, a small ball center with a great versatility and, you know, has a high basketball IQ and can knock down corner threes, which this offense will generate a lot of. That's a really good promising fit. 
I like that a lot. And I think, uh, I think he's got a, a shot at being there. The, the most intriguing name, I think that, um, and I seen this guy's name floated out there, several different people on maps, Twitter talking about him and I see it for sure. I think of these three, he's maybe, I, I think he would be possibly the biggest addition to the team out of the three names here. If you could get him, uh, that is Wendell Moore jr. He's six, six wing from Duke. He's solid at all three levels of scoring, a good defender. He can make plays. The thing about him is like, he's not spectacular at any one thing, but he's good basically across the board. Like he is a solid player. He might be a bench player, potentially your first year, but he'll be an impact bench player that first year. And you're talking about a guy who maybe year two, year three can be like a quality starter for you as well. So like, you bring in a guy like that who can impact defensively, offensively score at all three levels. And the worst thing you can say is like, well, he's not spectacular in any particular place, but he's, he's really good everywhere. It's like, okay, yeah. Problem. What's the problem? Like he, we're not asking him to come in and reinvent the wheel. We're picking at pick 26. You've already got Luca. You're going to be keeping Jalen. You're, you're fine with getting a guy that can be just balanced and, you know, bring in that, extra little something, something. So I think uh, Wendell Moore is the most intriguing of the three. I think EJ Liddell um, in terms of like immediate impact might be the biggest X factor. Okay. Well, I mean, just going off of those guys, I'm going to tell you right now, I know Lindell more than the other two, Mm -hmm. uh, but just listen to what you were saying. Number one about the kid from Arizona um, one thing I like about Arizona's program, they always got pretty much, they put out good players. Yep. And so I think that's what I like about that kind of mix. And you said he's six, seven with um, a six, 10 wingspan. That's real nice. You know, that's a good, and he's a defensive player. Mm-hmm. Um, and you like that kind of versatility, especially with those long arms, man, you can do a lot of things with that, especially you can cover. Uh, one, one thing I like about Giannis, he's not just big. He's so daggone long when you're mm-hmm. long and big, it, it's a big difference, especially when you're playing defense. Um, and especially if you want to play attacking defense, you want those type of long type players. So I love that. I know he's got some athleticism to him, I'm sure. Um, so I, that would be an intriguing pick. But I guess flowing with you, um, EJ, uh, is it what, Lindell? I, I don't want to make L- sure. Liddell. Saying. Liddell. Yeah. Now, I watched him. I, I'm not going to sit there and say I watched him all the time. But I did get to watch Ohio State basketball out here. Obviously, I live out here. So I do because uh, I got to see uh, – Braham, um, hmm. because he, I actually got to see him when he was in Columbus because he's from Columbus. So he came out to a few tournaments already. So when he went over to Ohio State, I was like, okay, because he was nice when I saw him in high school. But what you're just saying, I think he had a standing vertical. Uh, uh, what was his standing? I think one of the things what they were talking about was uh, with EJ was his athleticism. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people were surprised because it was it's sneaky. And just yeah. like you said, he can shoot. You got a lot of things that you can do with him. He can play a lot of things for you defensively. He can shoot for you. He's versatile. You know, he's six, seven, but he's got 240. So yeah. he's a strong guy and yeah. he can play the position defensively for you, multiple positions. So where you coming with the Draymond S, but like you said, that corner three, um, was really set up good at Ohio State. That's going to be the calling card for him, though. And that's the real good thing is when you can have that size at 240, be athletic, can shoot and defend, mm-hmm. now you become real valuable. And like you said, that's a real possibility with Dallas. I would like to be very intrigued if they looked at that. Um, how tall is the kid from um, Duke? 6'6". Six, the, six. the guard. Oh, he's 6'6". Six, six. Six, and six, he shot yeah. like 41% from three-point range. Mm-hmm. And he's not really a shot maker, right? He's not really a shot creator. He's more like uh, that. He can score at all three levels, but he's not, mm-hmm. like I said, he's not spectacular in any one area. He's he's mm-hmm. balanced. He's efficient from anywhere he, he scores, but he's got a little bit of playmaking to him. It's just, he's not a, like I said, he's not sensational in any one area, but he's solid and across the board. And I think, honestly, for what you need, that's a very solid thing. Like, I've seen him put the ball in the deck and pull like a Dirk Flamingo shot. Like mm-hmm. the guy's got some moves. It's just, he's not like a primary scoring weapon. 
got you. And like you said, he can definitely be in a tree because he definitely could fall in that range, right, where the Mavericks could be, you say? Yeah, I think uh, of these three names, I think he's the best option, like in terms of full impact, I think he's the best one of these three if he falls to you to make okay. an immediate impact. I, I think long-term he could have the, the biggest impact, but I think Liddell's, to me, a very intriguing second runner up to that. All right. So you name these three guys. So is there any, like, you know, I, I'm still on the big man. Is there any versatile, like a six ten guy can that could possibly maybe, cause this is my question. Cause once again, mm-hmm. DDP, you more on, I'm still coming in the fold with this, but as far as the draft picks, you got the, the first pick. That's what the 26 pick. Yep. Okay. And there's no second rounders. I don't think, I honestly don't think we have a second rounder this year. Like I said, I've, I, I'm up to speed on a lot of the stuff with the mm-hmm. draft, but like, mm-hmm. I'm not as in depth with it as any, I right, honestly right. hadn't looked much. I, I looked at like five or six prospects the last couple of days. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously I, I went through his video and everything and kind of saw that and was like, all right, here's some other names for me to check out. But uh, I have not looked at that. I don't think they have a second rounder though. Okay. So this is where it's gotta be. Um, you know, do you think if they're picking at this pick, is it going to be a developmental type pick when you name these three players? Would you, out of these three players you named, right? Mm-hmm. Who would be the go to guy that you would want and say, I would rather this guy, if you got to draft either one of these guys? I think Wendell Moore, if he, if you got him, I don't think he's having, I like, he might come off the bench, but he's mm-hmm. not going to be like a Josh Green where like his rookie year barely plays and then sophomore year, it's like, and he'll get some touches here and there, some burn, but for the most part, it's like very inconsistent. I, I think if, even if he's on your bench, I think he's a solid rotation player year one. Uh, Liddell, I think is in your rotation, but I, I think more is the most ready to go, like ready to go option for you to plug in here. If you're talking about like, Hey, if we're only thinking about like next year or maybe this two year window coming up, what do you look at and who makes the bigger impact? I think more has the better chance there, but honestly, for what Dallas's weaknesses are, there's a case to be made for Liddell. I just think more is the better player. Got you. Got you. Well, that's going to be interesting to see. Cause like I said, um, you know, the good thing about, you know, he shot what 50% from the floor, 80% from the free throw line mm-hmm. in his junior year. And you know, you're not going to get a lot of points scoring, uh, but still 13 points a game with all that talent they had around them. And Duke, yep. there's going to get be a lot of players from Duke drafted this year. Um, so to be uh, scoring like that at that clip with the talent around you, that to me bodes well uh, going into the NBA. And like you said, um, he might be a rotational player coming off the bench, but he'll be an active guy. He won't be a guy that'll just be sitting on the bench and won't be getting any tick. He, right. This is a guy that this is a kid that can actually be in the rotation and you'll need that kind of shooting. And I, I get kind of excited when you see that size and you're shooting like that from the field mm-hmm. and uh, free throw percentage is high like that. Yeah, I like to see that. And he's versatile. Um, so, yeah, I like I, 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 I'm feeling you on that DDP and I'm going to check some tape on him. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you mentioned earlier, like some of the some bigs, like I know the front court's obviously a problematic area for Dallas, but honestly, like and any had some of them in his list, but he had them all in that tier four range where he's kind of like, all right, the players got something like it's not like it's a wasted pick, but it's like the kid from Auburn, for instance, he's like, he's he's all right, but like. I, I'm not going to be excited about that pick. I'm going to have to trust that you know what you're doing if that's mm-hmm. your pick. And sometimes mm-hmm. those do work out. Sometimes a team takes a guy, you see it a lot in the NFL in particular, where uh, like Travis Frederick for the Cowboys, where everyone was kind of like, ooh, did you reach for, for that center? What are you doing? Like, And then when was he ever not great for Dallas? You know, like that's just kind of sometimes it works that way. But I, I think in this case, the the bigs that are there, even if they're there around 26, it's kind of like, I don't know if you're significant enough in comparison to where we can get some of these other guys in terms of helping us in the big picture. I think Liddell works kind of as a hybrid uh, for that purpose. And so if you were to look more of a front court player, a forward uh, slash small ball five, I think he would be the most intriguing one. But again, for total impact, my more, my money is on more. 
I'm feeling you. I'm just looking at some highlights while you were speaking. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yep, I'm I'm with DDP on that. I mean, obviously, you have to watch a little bit more tape, uh, but just seeing a little bit of what he does, um, I think he averaged like four assists, and he has a lot of alley-oops to the big man, yep. and we like that. You know, Luca likes that. But he can get to the cup, got some sleepy little game, can got a little post work. But I like his little jump shot. Um, and, and he looks like he creates and he got some athleticism, took him mm-hmm. to the hole and will kind of yam on you. So I, I like it. I, I feel you, DDP. Great, um, great, great stuff. And you know what thing I like about it is Duke always bringing players, dog. You feel me? Duke, Duke have players for, for ages now. And the talent that they continue to bring in is ridiculous. I mean, you look at their fives, they're to going all the way to their 10. They're dogs. So, yeah. um, to like you said, to get that many points a game with all that talent on the team, I like it. And I'm watching them. I'm excited if Dallas would to uh, be able to get him. For sure. And shout out again to any on, uh, on that video, like on the yeah, Liddell shout out, shout out for like the, knowledge. the Liddell thing where he, he had the comparison Draymond esque. Like that was like, as soon as he said that, and I, I went and looked at the tape, I was like, yeah, I see exactly what he's talking about. Like mm-hmm. that makes sense. Like that's a, that's an apt thing that actually kind of gets me a little bit more intrigued by the prospect overall. Cause like, once you see that, like, Oh, okay. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of undeniable, like what kind of impact you can get like that when you have a versatile guy that can guard multiple positions has a high basketball IQ. And, you know, like I said, Draymond used to be able to shoot a little bit, not so much anymore, but even still his impact is undeniable. So it's like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued, but for sure, it'll be interesting to see what they do. Definitely going to be interesting to see what they're going to do. So, I mean, the off season is here, man. Uh, what do you think Mavericks going to do outside of out, outside of that? Talk to me about some more Mavericks basketball. Uh, let's see. What what are they going to do? Well, we can jump into a conversation of something they perhaps should do, or do we want to first talk about what they've already done? Hey, you you let me know, DDP, because like I said, we've flown off you on this one because you're going about to spit some stuff on me, especially with a, a potential coach leaving uh, Luca. Um, who kind of, you know, we, we warned about that. So, you know, yeah. let me know. All right. Uh, you, you brought it up just now. So we'll, we'll roll with that. Cause I feel like that's probably the most significant pressing thing that has happened. We'll roll into topic three. We'll jump around. Uh, so Lucas, former Slovenian coach, Igor Koskakov has, I probably butchered that, but I tried sincerely, <laughs> uh, has left the Dallas Mavericks. He was an assistant coach on Jason Kidd's staff, and he has gone to Brooklyn to join Steve Nash's coaching staff. Now, that's intriguing for a couple different reasons. Like, first of all, he kind of was the offensive game plan architect here. So, yeah, the offense struggled out of the gate to start this year. But if you set aside, like, you almost have to set aside for Dallas those first two months anyway. Like, through well, basically December when they were 16 and 18, because mm-hmm. after that, we know how, how good they were the rest of the season, but the offensive efficiency overall, even including those bad months was 12th. If you take out those first two months, they were like number five or six, like they were way better. And that's, that's his system. If there's someone who knows how to maximize Luka Doncic running an offense, it's his Slovenian coach. Like he knows exactly what his strengths are. He's literally been around him for years. He gets it. And so that could potentially be a a big loss because Jason Kidd's a defensive minded head coach, right? Like that's the whole thing is like kid basically brought in and he's got to be fair. There's, there's an assistant on the staff as well. That's more geared towards like the defensive stuff. But I think kids fingerprints are more on that. Just especially looking at his his uh, coaching repertoire and history and stuff, you see everywhere he went the immediate defensive turnarounds. The offense is a different story. I think this is kind of like kid trusting a little bit more in uh, Igor and kind of letting him do his thing and just kind of overseeing it, but largely letting um, that kind of come together and adapt as it did. So it could be a potentially significant drawback, but. I don't know. Like it's interesting as well to me that Steve Nash is who kind of poaches him away because if you recall, Igor, you know, obviously he, he's won in Europe and he's done all of that, but it was like two or three months, I think before the 2018 draft, he was hired by Phoenix as their head coach. 
And that didn't end too well. Yeah. He immediately said, you, you got the number one pick. You got me. You hired me. Okay. You want Luca. That's your guy. And they were like, Oh yeah, no, that's great. Uh, there's no way we're not taking DeAndre Ayton. Right. <laughs> like, and now they're talking about getting rid of him. Right. Possibly. And <laughs> yeah, and, and it's like I get that Ayton was Arizona, like he he was the the homegrown kid, so to speak. But it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, it's not that Ayton's a bad player. He's not, but it's bewildering to me that you hired Luca's coach only to and had him immediately say, "This is what I think you should do," and then you basically said, "Yeah, no." It's like, well, then why did you choose me? Why was right. I your choice? And then right. he kind of got a raw deal anyway, because they only had him that one year. And it's right. like, wh- what did you think was going to, first of all, what did you think was going to change in a year? In one year. Yeah. Like how many teams make a move like that and then immediately go from poverty to like in the mansion, you know, like it, it just doesn't. So really- you have to have, you have to have like big three, big, big three and like three, you know, three bench players that are mm-hmm. like, top players to be able to say those type of things or you got to have all the parts but with none of the without the the conductor and then make a trade like the chris paul one was in which case they went from i think 34 wins to like putting a coach like that in the situation like that though i'm not doing that wait with paul and the new expectations probably no with uh yeah with igor like if i do if if you had a a ready-made team i'm not putting the igor in that situation um, the Cavs know, tried it with uh, David Blatt, I think it yeah, was. Yeah, it didn't work. Yeah, that didn't work it at was, all. Like they went terrible. to the finals, but LeBron was literally taking the clipboard out of his hand and drawing up I plays mean, that's himself. What, right, and that was crazy that they went to the finals with that team. That was not. He was just no disrespect, but he was like a puppet coach. Yeah, I mean the crazy thing was they hired him before they found out they were getting LeBron back. Otherwise, it's like maybe you should have waited a month and gotten LeBron's take on that. But uh. Yeah, it's regardless one year with that situation and what little they had achieved was ridiculous. But it's interesting then that it's like, okay, so then Phoenix Suns legend Steve Nash saw basically saw enough of Igor to be intrigued and was like, I'm going to see if I can get him on my staff. And, you know, I, I don't know the details of his arrangement, his deal, whatever, but I think it's interesting, like, is it a promotion in this case? Like, is he the number one assistant in Phoenix? Whereas in Dallas, I don't know where he was in that ranking. I don't know, but uh, I think it's interesting that uh, after one year, he moves on from Dallas. I would not have guessed that, but you know, at the same time, it's, you just had a deep playoff run and you were the hot new kid in town. His offense was turning a lot of heads And so I think people looked at that and said, like, look at how much spacing he's creating. Look how much floor, like the the number of wide open shots Dallas created in the playoffs so far outpaced any other team. Like the next closest team was nearly half as many opportunities. Dallas just ran out of gas to actually convert them at the end. So it's like, yeah, obviously Luca gets a lot of credit for that, but it's also you have to give some credit to the system. So Igor should get his roses for that. And I guess that's enough that uh, there were people clamoring for him. And when you're successful as a team, you're going to have your staff and some of your role players poached. That's just what happens. Yeah, that's just what happens. But after a year, that's kind of surprising to me. I mean, Mm -hmm. I wonder, um, I mean, you went to a successful organization in one year with Jason Kidd to, to me, an unsuccessful with Steve Nash. He's out there got to be doing some showing and proving. Yeah, uh, with these nets. So you going to to me and you're going with uncertainty. You don't know what's going on with Kyrie. You don't know what's going on with KD. So you're going in with a lot of uncertainty ben in Simmons. that situation. Uh, ben, I, I mean, you got Ben Simmons, but I, mean, I just mean on, he man. had back surgery. You don't yeah. you still don't know what you, you have. You don't there. know what you have in him. You don't. Right. He was out. So you just went to me to a very stable situation with mm-hmm. Luca. And you just went there. You want to build on that and, and and get even better to a situation like that in New Jersey. I just wonder if there was some underlying things on Dallas's side because that Maybe. just doesn't make sense to me that you do that after a year and go to successful to, to me, dysfunction. Yeah. No, I agree. What's bewildering to me is to consider the fact that uh, Phoenix, if they had just taken his advice, would have had a core of Luka Doncic, Devin Booker, um, Michael Bridges and 
you know, and Igor as, as your coach. And instead they took Aiton, who they're now apparently reportedly prepared to let walk in free agency and then spent big to acquire Chris Paul. And while yes, that got them to the finals for the first time since what, like 94 Barkley, three Barkley. Yeah. 93. I think that's right. Uh, 93 with Barkley. Um, it's like, yeah, you got there and you got a two Oh Lee. That's great. But like, you basically went all in on trying to win right then you don't acquire a 36 year old point guard like Chris Paul was at the time and not have the mentality of like, all right, we got a two, maybe three year window here. Like that's, that's kind of the mindset. Now I know kid won one at 38, but like, again, that's the outlier. Now to be fair to Paul before, you know, the last four games of the series against the Mavericks, he was still playing sensational. He was breathtakingly good in game two, but it's uh, it's incredible to consider. You could have had Luca, Booker, Bridges, and Igor all there, and be looking at Phoenix as like, dude, this might be like a Golden State type thing. Again, if Devin Booker is your second best dude, dude, that is good. I just don't think he's the guy if you want to be a serious contender. No, I mean I feel you on this. Uh, he's he's a he's a great. They want to Score. always do the Batman, Robin, Batman and Robin. If you're talking about Booker, he's a great, super nasty, nasty Robin. But there's a Batman that probably needs to be ahead of him. And like you said, if you had that Luca and him combination, that'd have been fire. Now you look at it, look like they don't even like each other. Right. But you know what I mean. Uh, one can dream and hope and feel uh, what happened. But um, you seen what the Mavericks did to you're just bringing it up with the Phoenix possibly. Um, you don't know if they're going to what they're going to do with DeAndre Aiden. Mm-hmm. And then even with the Utah Jazz, we we're talking about um, behind the scenes, how Quinn Snyder basically said, I'm done. And basically, you know, they were the the glamour of the NBA these last few years. Everybody's talking about the Utah Jazz. Dallas comes in there and dismantles them. Now they're talking about Donovan. uh um, Donovan Mitchell. being gone, Donovan Mitchell being gone, yep. uh, Rudy Gobert. Now they just Quinn steps down. Dallas does this, did all kind of stuff, man. Talk to me about that. Yeah, it's uh, just to give context to this playoff run for Dallas, like they essentially, as you said, just completely detonated the Utah Jazz as we know them. Quinn Snyder steps down after eight seasons there despite the fact that a uh, jazz CEO, Danny Ainge was said, Utah was quote desperately trying to retain him. So he was done. He was sick of the shit. Uh, Donovan Mitchell is incredibly conflicted about um, Snyder stepping down. He basically uh, is confused by the whole thing. Doesn't know what it means for his future. Utah today says that they are not taking uh, conversations, not taking trade offers for Donovan Mitchell. However, they say they are fielding offers and are in talks for Rudy Gobert. So yeah. you take a guy that's like a three or four time defensive player of the year. One of probably the, it, I mean, obviously that alone should tell you he's arguably the best defender in the NBA. I know this year it was Marcus Smart that won it. I don't know if Gobert is the absolute best defender in the NBA, but you can't count past two or three ahead of him, any position that said, the modern game is kind of evolving away from the more traditional lineup and his, shall we say, limited offensive game is a problem. Dallas floor spaced him and basically three balled him off the court where Mm -hmm. he was unplayable at times. Mm -hmm. And to do that to a multi-time defensive player of the year in his absolute prime is unbelievable. So Utah, they're looking at a situation now where their longstanding, highly respected head coach is gone their star player is conflicted and doesn't know how he feels about anything in the situation. And they're Robin in that case and absolute stalwart who has been there longer than Donovan Mitchell is now apparently going to be dealt away. Like that's, that's pretty complete and utter decimation to leave in your wake as you walk out of that. So I don't know. Jazz wouldn't surprise me in the least if they do some kind of rebranding here in the next couple of years now. Obviously, the new ownership group and everything. I think Dwayne Wade's got a stake in that. Wouldn't surprise me if they do like a total rebuild slash rebrand. And uh, Dallas started that. Dallas set that about in motion. This was kind of the last hurrah for this core, for this unit as it was constructed. And Dallas just basically swept them uh, 
not literally, but just swept them under the rug. Oh, it we, was just we, like, yeah, we, we swept them mentally. Yeah. We, yeah. Like you said, physically, Jalen Brunson but, happened. Yeah. That, that Jalen Brunson, uh, awakening arrival, his time really opening the door to really letting us know who Jalen Brunson really is. He just went over there and just totally destroyed them and just put, uh, he was Donovan the second Mitchell. best player in the series. You feel me? And he, and he was a guy was that was Donovan Mitchell was crazy. Yeah. He, he's a guy that was supposed to be at best an X factor for Dallas. And he was the second best player in the series. And that's only because Luca returned to the series after three games, mm-hmm. like unbelievable. He had a 40 point game with zero turnovers and an obscene usage rate that even Luca would like scoff at. Right. Like, unbelievable. What Jalen Brunson did in that series completely thoroughly unequivocally outplayed Donovan Mitchell and Donovan Mitchell is the one called a superstar and making like $200 million in his contract. So yeah, that says that speaks volumes. And, uh, you know, and as a result of that, that kind of set in motion now, and I don't have this set up as a segment, but that kind of sets up in motion, the conversation on Jalen's contract. Now I've seen certain metrics and projections. Now, um, it's a John Hollinger, kind of financial model that projects out a player's worth and what they're likely to get based on current market conditions as far as NBA free agency. Now he says it might be a little more generous than the deal he's likely to sign, but it was projecting him at like 28, 29 million a year. Wow. Yeah. Now to be fair, I I've seen him Hollinger say he imagines it'll be more like 24, 25. And I've seen some estimates and I have echoed this myself saying it might be more like 22, 23. But Jalen, he he's I can't believe I missed the quote when it happened in real time. But when the season ended, Jalen was saying, um, you know, playing next to Luka Doncic, like was it difficult to kind of like when Luka came back, sort of seed back that control. Like you had this super high usage rate. You were the focal point. And then you kind of had to go back to playing largely off the ball and uh, in a more supplemental role. And he's just like he's like, I mean, it's Luka fucking Doncic. Like, what do you what do you want? Like. Yeah, he is one of the best generational talents of of like this current era, and he's going to he's going to do his thing. My job is to fit in alongside him to see what is needed from me, what the team needs from me, what Luca needs from me, and then play to my best ability in whatever is asked of me. And that could change game to game. That could change quarter to quarter. It just depends. But that's my job. And like you're just like looking at that, and you're like that dude gets it. Like not many, not many guys have that kind of like, I guess, humble nature about them. Like there, there's too much ego. I feel like where everyone's like, yeah, that's cool. But like perfect example, Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook teammates in Oklahoma city constantly warring with like, who was considered like the guy, like Russell was like, all right, fine. I don't, I won't, I'll concede. He's the guy, but I want to be one a, I don't want to be considered Robin. I want to be one a, and like that was problematic, but like Jalen doesn't show that tendency at all here. So I it would not, I'm, I'm not expecting him to take a, like a big hometown discount. I really am not. I think he absolutely deserves to get paid and he's going to, but I could see a situation where it's at least a slight, slight, you know, kind of like we saw with Tim Hardaway jr. Just taking a little less to be here than an offer. He could have fielded elsewhere. Well, I mean, sometimes it ain't all about the money, man. I mean, I've talked to athletes before saying, you know, they went after it. They wanted to get paid. Their careers are not going to last for so long. But uh, some guys said they regretted just going after the money and going into the wrong type of situation, and it didn't bode well for them. And that's what people got to look at, too. And I think that's what players got to look at. Yeah, it's all good. You're going to get that money. You're going to get that money in the NBA, regardless because the way the spike is is going with the TV revenue, yep. things of that nature. You're going to get paid. Like, regular players are starting out with 15 milli. You feel me? So you're going to get your money. Um, but uh, taking a little less, it'd be a – you know, I'm not in that situation, but I feel like you're in a good situation. Mm-hmm. You got a role kind of getting carved out for you. Um, you, you. You know, just because you might get paid a little bit more somewhere else, you may not be doing what you're doing in Dallas. And that's what always have. I think players should be looking at that. What you're doing over here, you might not be doing over there, especially if you're not like the guy. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, if you're not like the guy, your role could change big time. Right. You you the guy, you know what you are when you go to a different team. When you're not going to be the guy, 
you you know your role could be something totally different and you're going to a new new coaching staff that may not believe even though they signed you may not believe in like the guy who coached you mm -hmm. and i think that has some precedence in it so i would hope you know Jalen would look at that and say hey I, i'm i'm real comfortable here i like my dog luca and we got we're building something great yeah that's what you certainly hope uh what's hilarious to me just before we transition off of this topic we were talking about the the detonation of the jazz phoenix might not be totally detonating but that is such a circus at this point it's actually kind of hilarious like not only you know they won what was it like 64 games this year something like that they were the best record in the nba 63 64 games and we're so arrogant going into the series obviously even um bridges was on a podcast i think it might have been jj reddick's actually yeah, JJ, i've seen it I've yeah seen it. and and he was trying to explain kind of what happened in that maverick series and he was pretty candid about it but like they essentially thought when they won game five they thought it was done they thought the series was mm -hmm. done that they broke dallas's will like all right dallas got going a little bit but you know we put our foot back on their throat it's done and then they came to dallas and kind of got hit by a freight train and it got into their heads that just like, you know what, we might be the home team, but like it's game seven and anything can happen. And then when Dallas started pouring it on early, when that was, that was Dinwiddie's best game this postseason, Dinwiddie and Luca just house of fire. And suddenly they're like, Oh, Oh, like they start feeling that momentum and suddenly it's a tidal wave washing over them. Yeah. And they, they just now. completely collapsed so badly mm -hmm. You know, they're down 30 at the half, but they're down as much as like 46 in the game. Just mm -hmm. obscene blowout, historic blowout. No, never in a seven game series had the home team in game seven been blown out that badly. And now, you know, what's what's the uh, the result of that? <laughs> you get a press release like two days later from the Suns organization basically saying like, well, obviously this isn't the, the ending we all hoped for, but that is the weakest thing I've ever seen. I would, I would cover my face if my team did that. I would, I would like, oh my God, I can't, I can't look at you right now. It's going to be at least a couple of weeks before I can even like look at you without judging you after something like that. Cause that is the weakest thing I've ever heard. Then you hear like, okay, they're how long and how ardent were they in the fact that like, oh no, we didn't make the wrong decision when we picked DeAndre Ayton. <laughs> Ayton's like never lost to Luca. Like he's, he's beaten him every year. Like he's been in the league. It doesn't matter. Like it's obviously we did the right thing. We ended up doing the Chris Paul trade and then Aiton was huge on our finals run where we went up 2-0. Obviously this is the right call. Flash forward to the end of that series. And now they're like, hmm. Yeah. Uh, he barely played in game seven, especially in that second half. And his coach basically said straight up, like it's an internal issue, kind of implying that like, he either didn't have the heart or he just like checked out. He just like folded essentially. And now Phoenix is like, yeah, we're not going to, we're certainly not going to max you and we're not going to pay like near that because we're that disappointed. It's like, oh yeah. So what you're saying is you fucked up. <laughs> if you, again, if you had taken Luca, you'd have Luca Booker. You'd still have uh, Michael Bridges and you'd be in just a, a totally different totally different situation with your franchise and what your future looks like. Instead, your window's not closed yet, to be clear. I, I, I still think Phoenix is going to be a, a quite good team, but now you're, now you're desperate. Now you're like, Oh man. Okay. He might not have, he might not have finished the series strong, but he had some great games that game five. When I, I thought that was going to be the turning point in the series, he kicked the crap out of Dallas. He had like, 21 and 22, like just monster. It wasn't 21, 22. It was like 22 points and like 13 or 14 boards, but he just destroyed us. We had zero answer. And it was like, Oh, you know, we kind of thought this was going to be the case the whole series, but this is really the first time he's gotten to us. And then he never really, he was quiet the rest of the way. His numbers were still good, but like it didn't matter because what Dallas was doing was mitigating that. So it's incredible to be in this situation where it's like you detonate one franchise total destruction and then the other one is like all right now we're going to move a major foundation uh foundational piece the guy that was supposed to be the number two kind of got relegated number three and now we're saying like and eh, we're just not going to pay you 
and making the front office trip all over itself, giving out public uh, statements and pub press releases. Now you have them constantly crying. Oh, Chris Paul had a, had a quad injury and it was, it was really problematic. Oh, you know what? We had a COVID outbreak. Like every week it's something there's, it's literally like PTSD. They're still trying to explain maybe even to themselves what happened in game seven specifically. And it's amazing because they just can't cope. Like, it's amazing that like you inflicted this much trauma on a team that like in their minds, they were already flash forward to the finals. hundred percent. They never had a doubt they were going to be back in the finals and you bounced their ass in the second round in humiliating fashion. That's just glorious. Definitely glorious. And one of the things though, with Phoenix, I mean, they need to calm down over there for real. Uh, Because like you said, I watched in the nineties with Barkley and Dan Marley and those guys, they ain't had nothing like that in all them years. So now all of a sudden they, you know, you got a little bit of talent, but it was really Chris Paul helped you, but he's old. So if you lose a Chris Paul, you might take a step back. And now you're talking about moving DeAndre uh, Ayton. I mean, dude, he's a good player. Yeah, like, they're moving on but, from not moving him. Moving him would at least get something. I mean, but my thing is there was always talking about – there was always rumblings with him since he got with Phoenix. Mm-hmm. I, I've, I've known that. There have always been some kind of rumblings with him, like he might not be the guy. And I think when they look, they look at his attitude – I don't know if it's the attitude that they think he had. I don't know if they think he has a killer instinct. I, I, I don't think, think he does. Yeah, I don't. You see, you can see him when he plays. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I've, I've watched tons of players. You, as you have too, DDP. You can see he got talent. He got world of talent. Mm-hmm. You can see he just don't have the killer instinct. He don't have that. Throw that ball into him. He's gonna take the game over and put the game, put the team on my shoulders, and I got this. He ain't that guy. So I think they're like, well, we don't really feel like he's that guy. So we can go ahead and just go ahead and move on from him. Pretty and, much. Um, I think any team he goes to, that's just who he is. Mm-hmm. So he just really needs to be surrounded by a bunch of alphas and just let him kind of play ball because he ain't that one. Yeah. The three teams he's linked to right now are Portland, Detroit, and San Antonio. Detroit's got Cade like Cunningham, has Cade Cunningham. So maybe that could be. I like that. something, but Detroit's been really bad for a while. And honestly, I was, like, I, I think Cunningham has certainly potential, but I still hesitate to crown him just because he seems like he's had trouble staying healthy. And it's like, man, there was a lot of hype there. And I feel like health has kind of made it, made it where I don't know if you like squint and look at it. Like, all right, is he going to reach that potential or is he going to be one of those guys that like can be sensational on a handful of nights a year? And then is just kind of steady outside of that. Basically is, is this guy like a true number one as he was the number one pick or is he just kind of like, yeah, he's, he's nice. He'd be a good like starter on like a, a quality team, but like he's not the dude. So that's, that's one that would be interesting. I, Portland, man. I, I think that whole thing's falling apart there. I, I think Dame is already peaked, obviously, and I think they're going to be on a gradual a good situation for him to go to Portland yeah. and just be shipped right back out of there. I, I agree. Uh, San Antonio has some interesting pieces. I think Pop is going into his last year. I think they've already yeah. said that. Like this next season is his last one. Yeah. Um, he might so, get some. He might get numbers over there, but he ain't gonna be nothing. Uh, yeah, he'll really be talking about. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you're and, gonna go be in the Spurs system, you're a cog in the wheel. Like you're not Tim Duncan. You're gonna be a cog in the wheel, and your team might be good, but you're not gonna look like a superstar. And I feel like he would care about that. Right. I, I like to see. I'm. I ain't gonna lie. I like to be. I. I, I am intrigued with the Denver. Uh, not Det- uh, Denver, Detroit, Detroit situation. I like Cunningham. Um, I agree with you with the health. Uh, but I watched him as a player. I think he. Um, I think he definitely can be that guy. I saw leadership toward the end. I saw him wanting to take the ball and take the game over many a times. Mm-hmm. Uh, where he wanted wanted the ball. He wanted that action. He wanted to be the man. He and he was putting bringing it. And um, I, I think he can continue to grow into that. Um, like I said, in my opinion, um, what's the kid that went over there from Sacramento and uh, during the trade? Oh, um, um, uh, from Duke. What's his name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bagley. Yeah, Bagley. Yeah, another um, guy taken in front of Luca. Yeah, and and everybody, you know, everybody was talking about Bagley was going to be the guy who mm-hmm. came out of Duke, and he just floundered at uh, Sacramento. And I watched him go over to Detroit. 
and I saw him play better. And I believe uh, Kay Cunningham brought that out of him. So I think not like DeAndre will be uh, great, somebody great, but I think Kay could bring goodness out of him. And I think it'd be a good fit for them because, you know, he's young and he's athletic and they need those type of big bodies to, you know, to kind of help the team. Yeah, it'd be interesting for sure. Mm -hmm. But let's move on to our next topic here. This one's a little more open, just kind of open like vibe. Like we're mm -hmm. just kind of talking here. Yeah. The Mavericks are due for a rebranding. They've been talking about it for a few years. Obviously, we're like three full years now past post Dirk era. You got to you think about these things. You got like AD, BC. Well, we're PD here, post Dirk era. And uh, it's surprising that they haven't already done a rebranding. Cuban's been talking about it for years. They had like that little contest at one point where fans got to enter, design their jersey uniform, and uh, the Mavericks would pick one as like their city edition that year. That was the 2018 Skyline jersey. And I, I liked the, uh, the inclusion of the Skyline. The initial unveiling was a little iffy just because like they somehow, even though it was – a press conference to show the Jersey. They found a way to like, not put like the, the ball on reunion tower. So people are like, that's not the Dallas skyline. What is that? And it's just like, how do you miss that detail? You're, you're the Dallas team, but uh, you know, they've, they've tried some different stuff here and there, but I, I definitely think they're due for a rebrand at this point. And what I'm interested in, what do you think, what is your opinion on possibly working a little bit of green back into those jerseys? Uh, I don't mind the green, but let's not get carried away with it. Yeah, I'm not That's saying go opinion. full Celtics green yeah, yeah, or anything. Yeah, no, 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 I know that. I'm just saying, just like in bits and pieces, um, I don't know. I have to look. Because uh, like I'm right looking, now. The, I'm looking at some of those jerseys right now. You know, yeah. With flex off and on. Um, like I'm right now, really, the Celtics and green guy. Bucks have real. green. Mm -hmm. Those are really the like only that. two. I don't like that green in the Hawks, though. In the Hawks? Real. Oh, you're talking about throwbacks? Some... Yeah, like yeah, 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 like that neon. Yeah, yeah, that's ugly. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm intrigued with bringing green back, but as an accenting color. Mm -hmm. I think you can find a way to do that. Um, like I like I was saying, the Celtics and Bucks are the only two teams currently using green the Charlotte slash new Orleans Hornets had like a teal for a while, but even that kind of transformed more to blue. Mm -hmm. Um, and now, you know, new Orleans rebranded the Pelicans and now, so they're like red Navy and like a goldish kind of hue. Uh, so very different there. There's not a lot of green. The Sonics were obviously green. That's, that's mm -hmm. really it. Like green is just not a, a common branding color And Cuban. I'm pretty sure even said, green I, I it was a twitter interaction but i'm pretty sure he said that uh green was not going to be the core color of whatever rebranding they do and that's right. that's fine and you know if they do the thing like they they did uh was it as recently as last year every five years they bring back the 88 season green mm -hmm. uniform i love those i uh, love those those you know, I'm 88 guys so i'm yeah. I, I definitely rock those as long as they bring those back Mm -hmm. every five those years classics. yes hardwood classics as long as they bring those back every five years i'm cool with that i will i'm fine with that that's enough for me as far as like heavy involvement of green um but i you know for me what's nostalgic when they initially did the rebranding was the 0102 season was the first season they had the current maverick logo and everything mm -hmm. i was always a fan of the road unis they had then when it was navy blue with like silver and white and like they had a they had in that case the the royal blue which is now like the predominant um maverick blue is on those it was the accenting color so it was like heavy navy with like the uh, dallas was like silver across the chest and the numbers were white and then you had like streaking kind of a like the maverick royal blue accenting down the sides like that was what they had before i liked those a lot i would not mind and on the screen here that people will see whenever this posts we're not live so you won't see it right, right. now but uh i've got the 
I think this was the icon uniform is what they had this year, though the Navy blue that just says Mavericks across the chest. Um, that's, you know, a Navy blue like that. But if you did something where you had kind of that green and the accenting uh, thing down the side, similar to the very small usage that those 0102 unis used, I think you could have something intriguing there. Um, I'll probably add something to the community chat. I saw a couple concepts that I really liked. Um, I don't have them pulled up here. Otherwise I would throw them on the screen now, but, uh, I'm, I'm interested in it. And I've even, I used to not like it. I'm kind of open to the idea of finding some way to include at least as a secondary logo, the OG Don Carter cowboy hat M. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would not mind seeing that make a comeback again. It's always on those every five years hardwood classics, but uh, I don't know. I think they need to do something different. If they want to keep the horse predominantly, that makes sense. That's fine, but they definitely need to change it up. And I, I think at this point, Cuban's been talking about it for like three or four years, and he just doesn't seem like he's in much of a rush to do it. <laughs> And it's like, we're in a decidedly new era and the team is actually really good again. If you were going to do it, it would make sense to do it now. When a new coach, you just came off the uh, Western Conference, you know, finals. Mm -hmm. uh, why wouldn't you jump right all in and just say, hey, we coming strong next year. We come with the new rebrand. It gets you more excited because there's a buzz right now with the Mavericks yeah. um, because of what happened and you got kid. And so there's a buzz. So if you got that buzz and Mark Cuban, you know, you're a businessman, you should be feeding right off this buzz and jump right on it. Um, but once again, yeah, let's get them 88 Mavericks uh, jerseys up in there, though, here and there, because I, I forgot. You know, I was like, dang, you know, I remember 88. I was I was uh, freaking a sophomore <laughs> in high school and them greens. I'm just looking at with Roy Tarpley because he was yep. such a dog with with Dallas. I was just watching him with them greens and. They just had them classic battles. Now, I, I know it's a little off topic, but, hey, we're just talking mm -hmm. right quick. But I remember them Mavericks, Lakers battles. Mm -hmm. Them was the only dudes, man, that just was in the way. Because for real, if the if the, if the the Lakers weren't in the way in them years when Mount, uh, Dallas had them squads, yep. Dallas got more, some, some more championships. They could. Yep. And they uh, they got all the way to we game seven squad. in 88. Yep. We had squad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> players you feel me my goodness all that talent that was on there like i just go back and look at it mark aguirre Orlando blackman Derek harper mm -hmm. brad davis mm -hmm. um uh john i mean uh james donaldson dead left shrimp dead left shrimp dog you yeah. feel me um the oh, greatest Randall's, german player in nba history prior to Dirk. Me? and he was just coming up when he come off bench like bro like they had so much talent man i i mm. I'm sad right now because daggone Magic Johnson. Yep. <laughs> yep. Game seven. Got got all the way to game seven and then uh, got knocked out. But yeah, I would like to see. I'd like to see at least as a secondary color or accenting color, a little bit of green. Give, give just that little bit. You don't got to get all fancy with it. Like they tried too hard a couple of years ago when they had like the whites with silver and gold. That was that was weird. That yeah. was that, that's them. That's them. Twenty twenty two babies. They these young kids want to get all wild with it. That's it's like the white Power worried. Ranger. <laughs> yeah, dog. It's like that's what I was worried about. DDP was when I said green mm -hmm. because they won't put the right type of green. You know what I'm saying? They put the weird green. It's like, come on, man. I mean, we all know. Like, I get it. They tried the white Ranger thing, but we all know the Green Rangers better anyway. Just, just right. go with that. <laughs> stop trying to try stop trying to do too much they do too much in these day and age that's the problem right they won't be too futuristic with it and it messes it up yeah i mean that's kind of the case with like all sports trends right now especially For like real. college football is insane uh, yeah. everyone's trying to be oregon it was bad enough when it was just oregon but i like i like the more traditional uniforms there but even still we'll see what dallas does um mm -hmm. i like um uh, some of the stuff they played around with, but I think they're also overcomplicating it. If you want to use the skyline, all right. If, if that's like a variant, you know, now you don't have just two uniforms like you used to, you got like four or five. You got like the home, the away, the icon, the hardwood classic, the city edition. Like, it's just like, 
it's overcomplicated as is, but like, if you want to have one of those, have the skyline. Cool. I'm fine with that. That's, that's cool. But uh, I, I think they definitely need to shake something up and they should just get on it because it's already been too long. We're, we're getting tired of waiting. Tired of waiting. Get it together, man. So Mark Cuban, like we said, man, you see the rave, you see the excitement right now is in the air. Why not capitalize off mm-hmm. of it? You can get more money too. Uh, ain't nothing wrong with getting more money, Mark Cuban. So, you know, you like that bread. So jump on this and make it happen, but just don't get weird with it. Don't get to 2022, 2027 20, with it. Just be normal with it and make it hot. You feel me? Yep. Throw, throw a little old school in there. It's okay. Don't forget about the old school. Right, right. Speaking of uh, impatience, Dalton Schultz is impatient huh. for his new deal. Yeah, which, he is. And that's what we call a segue. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so... So what we got here, I, I, I know, yep. I know some of the basics here, but mm-hmm. um, I'm kind of trying to process this cause I'm still wrestling with the fact he's making 11 million this year. Right. Well, you know, Cowboys do the Cowboys way. They want to sit around play around. I think honestly that uh, when Blake Jarwin went down and you know, mm-hmm. he basically was done uh, with the Cowboys, which once again, it hurts my soul that he, couldn't be there because I feel like he still was a better overall player right. than Dalton Schultz. He just wasn't healthy. So I just feel like that threw a monkey wrench in it. They didn't jump out there and do it. You know how they love the draft and they were going to attack the draft with a tight end. They brought five of them in on their pro uh, uh, 30 visits. So, you know, it was happening. Um, but I felt like once they lost Blake Jarwin, they got nervous. We don't have nobody. Uh, who do we have? We saw what he's done the last couple of years. Let's just franchise tag him and just figure it out. You know what I mean? Yep. Let's just tag him, figure it out, and we'll go from there. Um, but you didn't have to do that. You could have let him play um, and check the – the uh, le- hey, go out there and check the free agent market. You could have did that because we have been talking about Hayden Hurst was out there. He signed for like $3 million. O.J. Mm-hmm. Howard, those mm-hmm. guys were out there. Dalton Schultz is not better than those guys, in my opinion. And, and Joko, who just got that money – where he's frustrated because Njoko got the four-year, $56 million deal, $28 million guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure he's frustrated with that. But if we're looking at the eye test, Njoko is better than him. Yeah, Don- Dalton Schultz is a basic tight end, and he's frustrated because now we were talking about on the final word yesterday, Dallas Cowboys made him feel special by tagging him. So now he's like, well, I want to get paid. But there's nothing wrong with that, in my opinion, DDP. You uh, you deserve it. If you see these other guys that your numbers are better than them, yeah, you should go for that. But in my opinion, I wouldn't extend a Dalton Schultz. I would let him play on that one-year tag because he's not going to sit out. He's not right. going to take them fines. He's going to play this year. So I would use that one year, develop Jake Ferguson, see what you have in uh, Sean McKeon, and then you can still draft next year. You have Jeremy Sprinkle, who's a blocking tight end. You have that kid from Indiana, Pendergrass, or Pender, I, I can't remember his name, but he's really athletic. He's yeah. 6'6'2". You can stash him on a practice squad. So we'll see what you have this year. Don't jump in there because I feel like you made a mistake in tagging him, but don't jump in there and make another mistake, in my opinion, by paying him that money. Even if you have it out in a couple of years, you don't have to pay him $14 million a year mm-hmm. when you can just use this year to find out what you have in Ferguson and move on. And he's cheaper. Yeah. I, I think Dalton Schultz, I think he's fine as a tight end. Like his numbers were, were pretty solid, obviously last year, career year, uh, mm-hmm. definitely has a rapport with Dak, good friends yeah. with him. I think all of that helped. Uh, I agree that, you know, the, the Jarwin situation kind of made them feel some pressure. I think also just the way that the off season as a whole was kind of unfolding. They didn't want to look like they wanted any small win they could get. And so it was like, we've, we've re-signed Gallup. We've uh, franchise tag Dalton Schultz. And everyone's right. like, you're paying 11 million for Dalton Schultz. Really? Like I, he's not worth 11 million, but like, Mm-mm. so like, are you, but are you, trying to buy just one year of Dalton Schultz and just like, ah, fine, we'll deal with it for one year because we're going to draft someone, you know, you get Ferguson, we're going to try and develop him in that year and just do a handoff where it's not just a complete drop at that position for one year. Yeah. I assume it's that. Yeah. You don't, you don't give a long-term deal to Dalton Schultz. He's, he's in his uh, justification. He's right for trying to get that security. Cause right. You know, they're not going to, they're certainly not going to franchise him again. He'd get a 20% kicker on top of right. the 11 million he gets this year. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to do it again. And 
yeah, he can't sit out. He's going to have to play. It's like, you can't a take all those fines and then B have your career best year, be another full year out of people's minds. Think about how much people are just prisoner to the absolute current moment. If you talk about anything more than six months old, it seems like people are like, ah, what's he done? You know, like, right, uh, right, like right. That, that's, that's why we can't have like serious, like actual discussions and debates when we want to talk about like comparing players to different eras, because you already have people who are saying like Devin Booker's better than Kobe. Like I've seen those conversations and I'm just like, are you stupid? Like, yeah, they are a lot of people, yeah. stupid, but you know, this, but it's because they only stay in age. Yeah. They're, they only saw old Kobe mm. and now they're watching Booker and during the hottest run of his career. And he, they look Bro. at what they project like, Oh, obviously it's going to just continue going up, up, up from here. Right. Maybe, maybe not more likely not, <laughs> but like, everyone just focuses on what they see now and everything else is forgotten about. They lose all the context. It's like, they only keep the glimmer of the idea. And that's why you got people like you got people already forgetting like that Dirk did anything. And like, Hey, I used to get bothered by that. Like you disrespectful son of a bitch. But now I'm just like, you know what? Who cares, man? Dirk himself doesn't care. He's just like, whatever. I did my thing. I came in, I did what I wanted to do. It don't matter. Yeah. He literally doesn't even like he literally already defers saying that Luke is the greatest Maverick of all time. I'm like, Dirk, dirty. I love you. But no, like it, you don't have to crown him that hard. He already gets all the love and appreciation he needs. But like everyone just focuses on the here and now. And like in the case of um, Schultz, like waiting a whole nother year to actually play, even if he was willing to somehow incur those fines, he's not going to get like as big of a a contract the following year. So it's like, it's not even in the realm of consideration. He's going to have to play. So wait him out and then go run him out for the franchise tag one year, whatever you decided you were going to pay him 11 million for the year, deal with it and hope that Ferguson shows you enough that you don't get cornered into sticking with him any longer. You shouldn't have to even get cornered sticking with him. That's the problem. You shouldn't feel that way because he's not that type of player. Mm-hmm. If you're they, always they should have gone about, with the other guys. If they're if Stephen Jones is staying true to his word because he said it out of his mouth, we're not going to play regular players great money. Mm-hmm. He said that. That's why they don't go out in free agency and don't do that. He also said we're going to sign our own. Okay, well you have to look across the board. Is this guy worth being signed? When you look at this and that, and it's no disrespect to Dalton Schultz, get your money. But is Dalton Schultz going somewhere else and getting 14 million and turning no. up and going crazy? No, he's not. I don't believe it. And if it does happen, okay, but I'm still not going to believe it. You know what I'm saying? Like I've seen Dalton Schultz enough to say he's an okay player. Like he's a okay. He's not a bad player. Yeah, like, he's not that he's upper fine. echelon. He's not that upper echelon player. And you don't have to jump out there just because the market dictates. Stephen Jones says it time and time again. We're not going to set the market. How many times has Stephen Jones said we're not resetting the market? So if you're not resetting the market, this is a prime example for you not to reset the market and sign those shows to a multi-year deal. You should sit there and say, we're not. July 15th comes. We'll just wait you out because you will have to come to camp because once you sign that franchise tag, you are going to get fined now if you do not show up for a mandatory camp. So you can miss the OTAs, but you will be at mandatory camp and then just move on from there. You know yeah. What I'm saying? Yeah. No, I agree. He's, he's a nice player, but he's not a mismatch nightmare. He's nope. not a, a no, game breaking dynamic no. talent. And to me, that alone would say not worth franchising, but whatever, again, this is what they chose to do. So as long as it's a one year stop gap, fine but if they hitch their wagon to him long term i'm going to be incredibly frustrated my eyes might roll so hard in my head that i might faint like i won't even roll my eyes when even roll i just be like that's the cowboy way this is what yeah. they do you yeah know? it's uh it's tough being a cowboy fan sometimes I'm not gonna yeah, lie it is, man yeah it is uh, well uh what else we got in cowboy land right now oh i mean you know Any i think i talked about notes? I mean, just quick hit notes. Uh, the whole they had the home run derby the other, uh, last night, I believe. Yep. Um, and Michael Parsons went nuts once again, showing his athleticism. A lot of you know, Dak said he, he's one of the best athletes ever seen in his life. Jordan Lewis said he's like that as well. Um, so you know, Michael Parsons, you know, I kind of said, I didn't kind of say, I did say it. 
I said like last month that, you know, I thought he was becoming the new face of the Cowboys. I know Dak Prescott. I know how much they pushed Dak, especially after he got his contract. Mm -hmm. um, but when I see Dak, he's not taking these interviews like that anymore. Maybe he's going underground and working on his craft. But now all I see is Michael Parsons in the in the in the media, and all I see is Michael Parsons all over Cowboys faces, and 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 everybody's interviewing Michael Parsons and sitting down and loving what Michael Parsons is saying. So it's like to me the Michael Parsons show now in Dallas, um, mm -hmm. and he's backed it up with the first year. But now, I mean, I can ask you this. What do you feel about that? I mean, uh, would you say that he's becoming the new face of the Cowboys right now? I, th I think it definitely has that vibe where it seems like it's trending that way. And it's not the worst thing. In fact, for his sake, it's the smartest thing he could do is to keep putting himself out there and doing that because that's going to translate to his value whenever his inevitable contract situation does come up. Which and is going to be crazy. And I feel like that's going to be sooner than later. I feel like the Cowboys have already kind of opened a can of worms when they let Zeke, you know, push that button two years before his rookie deal was up. Mm -hmm. I don't know that Micah would play quite the same hard ball, but at the same time, I don't put anything past, past it anymore. So if he balls out again this year, higher uh, level, same, same or higher level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All the leverage in the world, plus being the, the face at that point, mm -hmm. potentially of the team, like, I, I don't know how you how you manage that. Like I guess Zeke, Zeke when he pulled that move, he really wasn't anymore. Like it was Dak. Zeke maybe for his first two years was kind of seen as the face, but by year three, really more four, year four, uh, around I guess the time Zeke did that, uh, it was it was Dak. Like that was considered the face of the Cowboys and everything. So, uh I don't know, man. I, I think it's smart for Micah to do it. I do get those vibes, but I also think it's just the fact that Dak and Zeke, the sort of old guard of, you know, being that central figure, they've been around for a while and they've done it. And they're kind of like, all right. Yeah. Like our, we're established here. We don't have to like defend this Hill. If it makes sense. Like, like you said, we can just go do our thing and just focus on whatever we're going to do for Micah. It's like, this is the show. This is what he wanted. When he talked while he was still at Penn State, dreaming of being a cowboy, like this is what he envisioned was like being this central figure at the center of it all, uh, the greatest circus, if you will. And like that fits. And he's got the on on field talent to turn heads league wide. Like, yeah, that's a perfect recipe to be the face of this franchise, even though he's a defensive player and God knows they love their offense. Yeah, but, you know, it could be a changing of the guard in that aspect because of Dan Quinn, mm -hmm. uh, because he's a D. He, I mean, everybody loving Dan Quinn right now, too, and he's got a lot of pull and a lot of say within one year. He has a lot of say of what goes on in that building as far as player personnel, as far as guys he wants. So him and Micah has been a great marriage um, so far. So I can definitely see him being the face right now, and even though he is a defensive player, he's a marketable defensive player. Mm -hmm. He's not a defensive player that you're, like, bored with because he has the star power. He knows how to speak and talk in the media. Right. And because of that, and he has the talent to match it, I think the Cowboys are just kind of banking off of it now and now kind of riding the wave uh, because, as I said, even though he's not offense getting touchdowns, sacks are huge forced fumbles, interceptions, when you're a defensive player like the Lawrence Taylors and those type of guys, um, that's still a hot commodity and it's still very marketable. Um, and so um, with that personality, I just feel like he is starting to become the new face. He's young. He's only, what, 21, maybe 22 years old. I think 22 um, now, yeah. 22 now. All kinds of athletic. He can back it up. I think he's going to have a tremendous second year this year. I don't think it was anything a mirage of the first year. I don't think he's the type of player that's going to fall off after that one year. I think his trajectory is going to go even higher and higher, and he's going to really become that dude in the NFL, in my opinion. Um, so I feel like the Cowboys, if they this is what they do, go ahead and market it. And I think he is becoming that face, and it's cool. Let that pressure be, be leave away from Dak. Put all the pressure on Michael Parsons. That would mm -hmm. be great. And then maybe they can leave Dak Prescott alone and then he can go ahead and quietly lead this team, hopefully, to something great later on. Maybe. I, I certainly wouldn't be opposed. Yeah. But, hey, I got something else I want to talk about. Ezekiel Elliott, man. Yep. He's in the news because, you know, he's saying he's eager to prove, just like the Cowboys are eager to prove people wrong. No, I'm not listening to none of that. But I'll, here's my thing. I want to ask you a question. Yep. <clears throat> 
Marcus Lawrence just signed a new deal where he signed like a kind of more like a guaranteed deal where he's getting that full contract in those three years the way he uh, gave up the money to really uh, allow the Cowboys to possibly sign other players. Right. And it hadn't really been done in Dallas. So he has a pretty much a three year guaranteed deal pretty much could end his career in Dallas or however it happens. Cause I know he's going to be like 30 some years old, but Ezekiel Elliott's 26 going on 27 years old. Would you be opposed if Ezekiel Elliott, let's say his 1200 yards this year, would you be opposed of the Cowboys keeping him in a deal like they did with DeMarcus Lawrence um, kind of maybe ending his maybe football type career out with the Cowboys or maybe with another three year deal and end out when he's like 30 or 31. Would you be opposed to that, or would you say, um, no, I'm kind of done with the Zika out of this year. It's time to move on and get somebody else. I mean, for the record, I didn't want to give him the last contract. But uh, if he had 1,200 yards, that would be his first 1,000-yard season in, like, three goes? No, right? he had 1,000 th- yards last year. He had 1,000 last year? Mm-hmm. He, that's why he stayed in that Philly game. Mm, that's right. That's right. I thought he just stayed just under it, but okay. Yeah. All right. Well, 1200 yards would be his best in like three years. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be a, certainly a bounce back year. I thought last year had more potential to be a bounce back year. I, in fact, I wrote about it. Um, he did get injured though. He did, but that also frustrates me because we saw how he was allowed just to kind of keep taking those touches and getting the line share, even though he clearly, regressed like because of the injury like i get it like oh it's it's not going to get any worse well it kind of sucks like your run game went from balancing the offense to completely imploding and it made everything else harder and i don't know i i'm i frust i'm frustrated with the coaching staff for that but as far as a new deal like how so how would that affect his current deal right like how many Years does well, he still I have mean, left on the current the, one? The way his uh, contract is set up, they can do, do that out, and I believe they'll save like over ten million dollars if they do the out next year. They just kind of have to wait till that contract kind of ends, but the out is next year. Okay, um, at the end of this season, so they can remove themselves, and the cap hit is not going to be significant mm-hmm. like it would be this year. Because if they just released them, it'd have been like a twelve million dollar hit. Um, but if they do it next year, it's not going to be that. But they can do it like they're paying like, like D law at that point. Yeah. And that point renegotiated to where he gives up a bunch of money for the Cowboys uh-huh. to sign somebody else again. And he gets a deal like Demarcus Lawrence, where it's kind of like a guaranteed three year deal. You're 27 years old. You're kind of maybe finisher. We'll see. We don't know how much longer our running back plays after that. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Maybe kind of we keep you in Dallas. Uh, because you're still maybe marketable because Ezekiel Elliott still is marketable and they love him in Dallas. Um, and he still has clout. No matter what a lot of people say, a lot of people still love Ezekiel Elliott. Yeah. Uh, the Joneses mm-hmm. definitely care about marketability for sure. Mm-hmm. My thing is like, I, again, I probably wouldn't because right. I, I think it, I think he's an inhibitor at this point. I think he's blocking a progress stopper. Right. Uh, I think it's, kind of similar there where we could be doing other things, at the running back position that would be getting equivalent or better production at a way less price. Now, if you, if you've got an out after next year, then I'm taking the out because I, I don't want to be paying this much for my running back anyway, especially when his production has slipped overwhelmingly year over year. Um, but could I see Dallas to your point? Could I see Dallas doing that? Yes, I could see Dallas doing that. Would Zeke willingly do that? Maybe for the long-term security he would. Um, but God, if he was going to do that, I would say like my only requirement is like, all right, we'll pay you like this. But we're we're doing 50-50 on like the running back looks here. Maybe not like legitimately 50-50, but we're balancing this. We're not gonna basically make it where you're the featured guy and we're hardly using uh, you know, our our oh, other yeah whether it's pollard or whoever i mean i'm thinking like three years ahead so i'm trying to think like all right well they're not going to resign pollard who's going to be the running back then right whoever the other running back is um you know we got to have balance it's like if you want to be the ceremonial starter if you will um fine but i i don't want him to be the featured back at this point he can be productive for you still that's great get production out of him while you can but 
for what you're paying, I don't want him to be the end all be all. And I don't want it to be a situation where he's blocking uh, the running back position depth and development. Right. Well, I feel like I said, I feel you with that, but you know, if they don't bring back TP, like I don't think they will, I think Mm -hmm. they should still go after a running back. That's going to already say that you're not going to be the starter. When you come into the next year, you're probably going to be the backup at this point. Now, um, if they pay him and, you know, work out something where it's going to be okay. So I think Steven Jones will do something like that. I feel like the Cowboys organization, I thought they would move on from him. Steven Jones already mentioned his money, but if he still has star power in Dallas, they will consider keeping him for the simple fact that he's bringing people still in the stands. That's the way the Cowboys work. Money, they want to say money. all they want yeah, yeah. Um, about winning being first and they're trying to win the Super Bowl. It's about that money first and whatever can market that team to get more money into this building. They're going to do that. And that's what they're going to stay on top of. And if they can make sure they still stay competitive in that, that's good for them um, because nobody can come at them saying they're not trying. I know their evil ways and how they try to spin it to people. Yeah. But like I said, I don't follow I'll fall for that because like I said, it looks good to the media. It looks good to the fans that it looks like they're still trying but in aspect, they're just trying to keep that money going. I mean, at this point, even the even the players at camp have acknowledged the team is not as talented of a roster as it was pound for pound as last year. So, like, they can say however they want. They can say like, "Oh, we're going for it," but it's like you, know, you look at it, it, you look at it, and it's just like, "No, you're not." Like you you made a calculated decision, and whatever motivated that decision was not trying to go win a Super Bowl right now. Like I saw some stat today, just real quick. That was like, it said that Amari Cooper makes this next season makes only $3.5 million more than the median wide receiver salary in the NFL. Like that's uh, now I'm sure they're talking about like wide receiver, like ones, but Mm -hmm. again, basically just a hair over like that, the middle point, (laughs) like, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty, interesting that you say he's not worth that i don't know i i feel like that's going to be a move that we're still trying to figure out just what the hell they were thinking or doing or why they came to the conclusion they did and then to somehow only get what they got out of him like in terms of a trade it's like not only did you move on from him but you found a way to get almost hilariously nothing compared to what all these other premium wide receivers that move teams in the offseason got yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm still bitter. Uh, yeah, I just feel like, you know, the front office, especially Stephen Jones, he's just a joke with it. Um, and, and, you know, chemical engineering just wants to act like he's the best guy signing people. Um, there's no pressure on him because nobody's telling them what to do. He's spending daddy's money. Ain't nobody telling them what to do. So there ain't no sense of urgency. I don't care what they say. There's no mm-hmm. sense of urgency. You can't. There's. See, I mean, me telling you that there's no sense of urgency when you let go of those players and you didn't really replenish it with players that could really take you over the top, that shows there's no sense of urgency. So they're just proving it. Um, And the coaching staff, I don't know if the front office aren't hindering them as well. Uh, We already had um, the problem with the Sean Payton, Mike McCarthy thing, right? And uh, Jerry Jones saying he has an affinity for Sean Payton and Sean Payton quits and he's sitting in the booth for a year with over top of Mike McCarthy's head and Mike McCarthy is uh, hearing all this crazy stuff. So there's already dysfunction with that. So, you know, it's just really just the same old thing in Dallas. Just nothing really changes. It's just the same old thing kind of with Dallas and we'll see what happens this year, but I don't see where and Dallas wins 12 games in my opinion, but it's just by default by the schedule. They yeah. say it's one of the easiest schedules. And when you look at toward the end of the year, it really, they're all, a lot of those are winnable games because of the talent that has the talent, but playoffs is what it really matters to me now with the Cowboys, not no regular season. Yeah, no, I agree. It's a, it's always a circus and all the Joneses care about is that it's entertaining Win, mm-hmm. lose. They Jerry don't care. Just be entertaining, I mean, entertaining, make money. He don't even care. Yep. He uh, said he don't even care if it's negative press. As long as Dallas is in the press, even his negative press, he's cool with that. Jerry's got three titles and he's in the Hall of Fame. There's literally nothing else he needs at this point. At this point, anything is just icing on the cake. Icing on the cake. He knows it. And he's trying to fool all these fans out here. 
He's sitting there saying everything's house money. Doesn't matter. Right. I'm good. Yeah. People, I'm still, I'm winning. I'm, I'm still making big money. How am I losing right here? Yeah. Fans might be mad, but they're still coming to the stands. Yep. They ain't that mad. Right. hundred <laughs> percent. I agree. So there it mm. is. So yeah, it is what it is with these Cowboys, man, but we'll see. OTAs are uh, mandatory mini camp is right around the corner. Um, I think they have another set of OTAs like on between the 10th and 12th and the 14th. Yeah. Then mini camp is right around the corner. Then training camp. I'm going to be out there at the end of July, uh, first week of August. You know, it's kind of an annual thing with me now, DDP. I just like going to Cali now. You yeah. Know what I mean, I've been nice. out there three straight years. Uh, so I'll be out there at camp again. So I'm excited about that part. And I do like seeing the young players. I want to see Tyler Smith, what's really going to happen with him, a left guard, left tackle. Jake from State Farm, Ferguson. See what how Jalen Tober is back at practice now. Uh, Dak confirmed that. Um, you know, and we're going to see Sam Williams, the the Michael Parsons look alike. Yep. Uh, you know, he's getting rave reviews. So it's some things to really look at heading into training camp and some interesting stories of what's going to really happen um, with the receiving core, um, defense, um, linebackers. Then so it'll, it'll be interesting as we get ready to come up to that. Um, but is anything we got anything to say about? Uh, before we talk, before we run, run up out of here, uh, no, not that, not that I'm aware of. There is a chance, for, and I'll keep everyone posted. But there is a chance we run live next week. Oh, we got, we got to make that happen. Don't let make a chance, DDP. Don't, yeah. don't tease them. We need to go live. All right, yeah. So we'll go live next week, and uh, we'll probably find a way to do maybe a simulcast. Okay. We'll, yeah. We'll figure that out. We'll we'll figure yeah. out a way to go simultaneously live on both channels, uh-huh. and uh, we'll mix it up. We'll take your questions and uh, we'll work from it. We'll talk more draft. We'll talk more Cowboys OTA. Hit all the bases. Yeah, and it's it's like I said, it's right around the corner. NBA draft. Want to see what young player possibly comes with the Dallas Mavericks? We threw out some some names. Obviously, we're going to get a little bit more detail with it. But yes, get in here. Get in here, get in here next week as we go live. Mavericks, Cowboys, a lot of cigar and great good stuff coming on. And it will be episode eight for Positively Relentless. So make sure you're in the building. We want you deep in there. Questions, comments, all that good stuff. We want to hear it and we want to have a good time. But sad to say, we're going to go ahead and end it up out of here. Yep. So for myself, Big Game James, DDP, Dallas Prospect, you know how we do positively relentless we'll be talking to you soon we out peace there we go i was trying to find my mic to i was like letting the in screen play out and i was like i gotta mute my mic before i say something <laughs> <laughs>